Gnada Narayan Rishi, the Siddha Mahasi Mahi, to Mother Saraswati, the Goddess of Learning, and onto Srila Vyasadeva. We are so this morning. There are three verses together. On Canto 7, Chapter 6, Vlad Maharaj instructs his demoniac schoolmates. So we'll go through this, these three verses line by line. First, please repeat after me. Parabareshu Bhuteshu Parabareshu Bhuteshu Ramantas Tavaradishu Ramantas Tavaradishu Bhautikeshu Vikareshu Bhautikeshu Vikareshu Bhuteshu Atta Mahatsucha Bhuteshu Atta Mahatsucha Guneshu Gunasam Yecha Guneshu Gunasam Yecha Guna Vyati Kare Tata Guna Vyati Kare Tata Eka Eva Paro Hyatma Eka Eva Paro Hyatma Bhagavan Ishvaro Vyavya Bhagavan Ishvaro Vyavya Pratyagatma Surupena Pratyagatma Surupena Drishya Rupena Chasvayam Drishya Rupena Chasvayam Vyapya Vyapaka Nirdesho Vyapya Vyapaka Nirdesho Hi Anirdesho Vikalpitaha Hi Anirdesho Vikalpitaha Kevala Anubhavandan Sorry Break it up Kevala Kevala Anubhavananda Anubhavananda Svarupa Parameshwara Svarupa Parameshwara Mayaya Mayaya Antarhitaishwarya Antarhitaishwarya Iyate Gunasargaya Iyate Gunasargaya Para Avareshu Para Avareshu In exalted or hellish conditions of life in exalted or hellish conditions of life. Bhuteshu. Bhuteshu. In the living beings. In the living beings. Brahma Anta. Brahma Anta. Ending with Lord Brahma. Ending with Lord Brahma. Stavara Adishu. Stavara Adishu. Beginning with the non-moving forms of life. Beginning with the non-moving forms of life. The trees and plants. The trees and plants. Bautikeshu Bautikeshu Of the material elements Of the material elements Vikareshu Vikareshu In the transformations In the transformations Bhuteshu Bhuteshu In the five gross elements of material nature In the five gross elements of the material nature Atta Atta Moreover Moreover Mahatsu Mahatsu in the Mahatattva, in the Mahatattva, the total material energy, the total material energy, cha, cha, also, also, guneshu, guneshu, in the modes of material nature, in the modes of material nature, guna samye, guna samye, in an equilibrium of the material qualities, in the equilibrium of the material qualities, cha, cha, and, and, guna vyatikare. In the uneven manifestation, in the uneven manifestation of the modes of material nature, of the modes of material nature, tata, tata, as well, as well, ekaha, ekaha, one, one, eva, eva, only, only, paraha, paraha, transcendental, transcendental, he, he, indeed, indeed. Atma, Atma, the original source, the original source, Bhagavan, Bhagavan, the supreme personality of Godhead, the supreme personality of Godhead, Ishvara, Ishvara, the controller, the controller, Avyaya, Avyaya, without deteriorating, without deteriorating, Pratyak, Pratyak, inner, inner, Atma Swarupena, Atma Swarupena. By his original constitutional position as the super soul. By his original constitutional position as the super soul. Drishyaru Pena. Drishyaru Pena. By his visible forms. By his visible forms. Cha. Cha. Also. Also. 
Swayam. Swayam. Personal. Personally. Vyapya. Vyapya. Pervaded. Pervaded. Vyapaka. Vyapaka. All pervading. All pervading. Near desha. Near desha. To be described. To be described. He. He. Certainly. Certainly. Anir desha. Anir desha. Not to be described. Not to be described. Because of fine, subtle existence. Because of fine, subtle existence. Avikalpitaha. Avikalpitaha. Without differentiation. Without differentiation. Kevala. Kevala. Only. Only. Anubhava. Ananda Swarupa. Ananda Swarupa. Whose form is blissful and full of knowledge. Whose form is blissful and full of knowledge. Parama Ishwara. Parama Ishwara. The Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Ruler. The Supreme Ruler. Maya. Maya. By Maya. By Maya. The illusory energy. The illusory energy. Antarhita. Antarhita. Covered. Covered. Aishwarya. Aishwarya. Whose unlimited opulence. Whose unlimited opulence. Iyate. Iyate. Is mistaken as. Is mistaken as. Gunasargaya. Gunasargaya. The interaction of the material modes of nature. The interaction of the material modes of nature. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Controller, who is infallible and indefatigable, is present in different forms of life, from the inert living beings, stavara, such as the plants, to Brahma, the foremost created living being. He is also present in the varieties of material <coughs> creations, and in the material elements, the total material energy, and the modes of material nature, Sattva Guna, Raju Guna, and Tamo Guna, as well as the unmanifested material nature and the false ego. Although he is one, he is present everywhere, and he is also the transcendental super soul, the cause of all causes, who is present as the observer in the chorus of the hearts of all living entities. He is indicated as that which is pervaded and as the all pervading super soul but actually he cannot be indicated. He is changeless and undivided. He is simply perceived as the supreme Satchit Ananda, eternity, knowledge and bliss. Being covered by the curtain of the external energy to the atheist, he appears non-existent. Report. Not only is the supreme personality of Godhead present as the super soul of all living entities, at the same time he pervades everything in the entire creation. He exists in all circumstances and at all times. He exists in the heart of Lord Brahma and also in the cores of the hearts of the hogs, dogs, trees, plants, and so on. He is present everywhere. He is present not only in the hearts of the living entity, heart of the living entity, but also in material things, even in the atoms, protons, and electrons being explored by material scientists. The Lord is present in three features as Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. Because He is present everywhere, He is described as Sarvam Kal Idam Brahma. Vishnu exists beyond Brahma. Bhagavad Gita confirms that Krishna by His Brahman feature is all-pervading. Maya Tatang Idam Sarvam but Brahman depends upon Krishna, Brahmano hi pratishtaham. Without Krishna there could be no existence of Brahman or Paramatma. Therefore Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, <coughs> is the ultimate realization of the Absolute Truth. Although he is present as the Paramatma in the core of everyone's heart, he is nonetheless one, either as an individual or as the all-pervading Brahman. The Supreme Cause is Krishna, and devotees who have surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead can realize Him in His presence within the universe and within the atom. Andantarasta paramano chayantarastam. This realization is possible only for devotees who have fully surrendered unto the lotus feet of the Lord. For others it is not possible. This is confirmed 
by the Lord Himself in Bhagavad Gita 7.14. Kaivik Yeshu Gunamai Mama Maya Durakya Mame Vye Prapadyam Te Maya Metang Tananti Te. The process of surrender in a devotional attitude is accepted by a fortunate living being. After wandering through many species of life and many planetary systems, when one comes to the real understanding of the Absolute Truth by the grace of a devotee, one surrenders to the Supreme Personality of God as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Bhavanam Jamanam Ante Kyanavan Mam Prapadyati. Prahlad Maharaj's class friends, who were born of Daitya families, thought that realizing the Absolute was extremely difficult. Indeed, we have experienced that many, many people say this very thing. Actually, however, this is not so. The Absolute, the Supreme Personality of God, is most intimately related to all living entities. Therefore, if one understands the Vaishnava philosophy, which explains how He is present everywhere and how He acts everywhere, to worship the Supreme Lord or to realize Him is not at all difficult. Realization of the Lord, however, is possible only in the association of devotees. Therefore, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his teachings to Rupa Goswami said from Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 1951 The living entity in the material condition wanders through many varieties of life and many varieties of circumstances but if he comes in contact with a pure devotee and is intelligent enough to take instructions from the pure devotee regarding the process of devotional service, he can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the origin of Brahma and Paramatma, without difficulty. In this regard, Srila Madhvacharya says, Antaryani Pratyagatma Vyakta Kalo Harismitaha Prakritya Tamasa Vritta Vat Harer Aishwaryam Na the Lord is present as Antaryami in everyone's heart and is visible in the individual soul, covered by a body. Indeed, He is everywhere at every time and every condition. But because He is covered by the curtain of material energy, to an ordinary person there appears to be no God. <coughs> so first, in this section of three verses, Sri Talad Maharaj begins with an analysis of the material creation. He mentions that there are different forms of life which are grouped into two categories, the moving and non-moving. And then he explains that there are elements. This is according to the Sankhya uh, division of the parts of creation. There are elements, uh, the total material energy, the avyakta, and the modes of nature, and the false ego. So the Sankhya philosophers uh, there are actually two, the Bhagavad Sankhya philosophers who follow uh, Kapila Dev, Lord Kapila of Third Canto, Devavati Putra Kapila. Then there are the Nirishwara Sankhya philosophers who follow another Kapila, who is an atheist. So this atheistic Sankhya philosophy, it is being mimicked today by modern scientists, although they count up the elements differently. They have their table of elements. I don't know how many of them now. Last time I looked, <laughs> it was something like 110. But this is the business. This is ex precisely the business of these materialists. The uh, word Sankhya means to count. And that's their business. They, mm. they count up the material elements in different ways. 
even in 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, what Krishna says, he points out that there are some who say that there are, I think, seven, nine, different numbers are there. Uh, so Sri Krishna himself in Bhagavad Gita, he says, there are 24, Lord Kapiladev, in 3rd canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, says 24. So, we don't go around counting. We just <laughs> hear from the Lord and accept. But there are others who feel they must count. No, I must count, to be sure. So, although they have passed in this world since time immemorial, uh, since ancient times with the Nirishwara Sankhya philosophers, to the present time with the modern uh, physicists, they have passed in this world as being very intelligent. Actually, they're mudhas, they're fools. <laughs> there is a, a, a nice collection of stories, um, analogous stories from South India. Uh, Guru Paramartha and his five disciples. And in these stories, one sees illustrated in a humorous way uh, the different philosophical positions, non especially non-Vedic or uh, non-devotional philosophical positions. They're illustrated and their faults are pointed out um, by this uh, uh, collection of stories, Guru Paramartika and his five disciples. Young boys in Gurukul could be taught difficult points of philosophy. So uh, the stories open with uh, the Guru, who is a fool, <laughs> and his five disciples who are bigger fools because they were following <laughs> a fool. <laughs> so on their on the course of their travels they came to a river. <coughs> And the Guru had been speaking as they were walking along. He'd been speaking that life uh, is to be equated with movement. Whatever moves, that we may understand to be living. So he was pointing to the trees which were blowing in the breeze. And he said, this is how we know that trees are alive. See, they're moving. <laughs> now this may sound funny, but the atheistic Sankhya philosophers, they give such examples of uh, scorpions coming out of rice and spontaneously <laughs> and uh, this is one example they used to explain creation how everything arises ultimately from matter another example they give is that grass spontaneously transforms into milk it just happens to go in the stomach of a cow and then <laughs> somehow it becomes milk <laughs> but they actually present this as being spontaneous so this Guru Paramartha was uh, instructing his disciples, whatever moves, that is a lie. So then they came to the river. And to cross this river, the river was moving. <laughs> so they became afraid. They were alarmed. Uh, what to do? This huge living entity is in front of us. And we have to somehow get across it. And then one disciple saying, yes, this river is very tricky. I remember... Uh, years ago, my uncle uh, crossed this river. He was uh, bringing salt, bags of salt, cloth bags of salt, uh, on the back of a donkey. And he crossed that river. And when he got to the other side, the bags were empty. The river stole all the salt. <laughs> so the, the disciples so, were talking very alarmedly among themselves. And the guru was wondering. <laughs> What shall we do? Then they saw from the other side a horseman ride across the river. The river was not so deep, so the horseman could ride across. And they were thinking, hmm, maybe it's not so dangerous. Maybe uh, we can do it. Maybe the river is asleep. <laughs> so then Guru Paramartika, he had an idea. He said, take a branch and light it in fire. So they took the branch and they lit the fire on the end of the branch. And then he said, now put it in the river and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very carefully, one of the disciples, he put the burning end of the branch into the river and then it hissed 
And steam came out. They all fell back. Oh! No, now the river is woken up. The horseman must have woke up the river. Now it's not safe. <laughs> so then they, they waited a while. And later on they tried again. But this time with the, the branch because it had been stuck in the water. It wouldn't, it wouldn't light anymore. It was damp. So they, anyway, placed that in the river and there was no reaction. Well, the river went back to sleep. So then they crossed. <laughs> but Guru Baramatika was very afraid. So when they crossed the other side, he thought, now before we go any farther, uh, because you told this story of the, how the river snatched away the, the salt from the bags. So we have to make sure that everyone's here. So let me count. So then he counted I, the number of those present. And somehow they knew that there should be six, but he could only count five because he wasn't counting himself. <laughs> and this is, this again, this is the, the mentality of atheistic Sankhi philosophers or materialists because as Sri Prahlad Maharaj says in another verse, very famous verse in the seventh canto, that ye uh, bahir uh, arta mani, bahir arta, their consciousness is turned outwards. It's very, very difficult for them to understand the self. The atheistic Sankhya philosophers, they have only a very vague glimmer. They have only a very vague understanding of the self as being different from the matter that they're counting up. Uh, they really don't know what is the true nature of the self. They just have some idea that there is consciousness. Just like today, modern scientists too. They have some of them, some of the physicists, they have some idea that there is consciousness, which is observing matter. But more than that, they don't know. So in that, that it's very, very difficult for them. Uh, there's a, a big discussions among the scientists. Some don't accept that, so they argue. So similarly, Guru Ma Paramartika, because his consciousness was so outwardly directed, when he counted, he only counted up five, and he became very alarmed. Someone's missing. And one of the disciples said, well, I'll count. And then he counted, but he only, also only <laughs> <didn't> count. <laughs> so then they were lamenting, oh no, one of our number is gone. <laughs> and they were calling, calling out his name and threatening the river. You rascal, give him back. <laughs> In the meantime, some clever person <laughs> came on the scene and saw all this. And then he stepped up and said, Now, don't lament. I can return the missing person. But, first of all, I need a fee. I'll take five gold coins from each one of you. Now, that's a lot of money. But they were so desperate that they paid. And he said, all right. And he said, now, you must follow my instructions. I know how to get back the missing member of your group. And you must do exactly what I say. Yes, whatever it is, we'll do. So I want you to all turn your backs to me and bend over. And then, when you feel something, I want you to shout a number. <laughs> beginning with one. So they all, they all bent over. And then he went from one to the other and kicked them in the backside. <laughs> one, two, three, up to six. And they were very grateful to him. Oh, dear sir. <laughs> you are so intelligent, so wise. You returned our missing man, whoever he was. <laughs> they were looking. Who was it? <laughs> anyway, now, now some other six of us. That was proved. This is the empirical method. <laughs> now it was proved we can have faith <laughs> that there are six of us here. And as they were walking away, then they also met one old lady who came by. This old lady had, had uh, just come on the scene as they were paying this person, and he went away with a big grin on his face. <laughs> Bang, three coins. And she said, why did you pay him so much? And then they explained the whole thing. And she said, oh, you foolish boys. <laughs> she said, I have, I have a good idea for you. Look, 
from now on, you will always travel holding a, what, what they call a cow pie. <laughs> a piece of cow stool. Someone should always carry cow stool. And whenever you have uh, some difficulty like this, crossing a river or whatever, uh, before you enter the river, uh, you, yeah, she said you, you, each of you, you poke your nose into the cow pie. So there'll be six depressions in one side. And then when you come out, each of you poke your nose in the other side. And then you can count that way. So they thought that was a very good idea. After that, they were carrying a, a cow pie wherever they went. Also, the scientists, they do their experiments you know. on such very absurd principles. They, they base, base all their theories on some result experiment with a piece of stool or something. <laughs> So, so these persons, as Pallad Mara says, not te vidu svartika timhi Vishnu. Uh, they do not know that Sri Vishnu is the goal of life. Uh, rather, uh, durasaya, uh, what is that? Durasaya bihir arta manina. Their business is because their hearts are full of material desires. That's why, <coughs> that's why they don't know that Lord Krishna is the goal. They're not interested. Rather, their business is simply to speculate about this external material world. And by this process of so-called knowledge, materialistic people accept this as knowledge, but Pallad Maharaj condemns it. Andayatandayar upaniyama. So it is actually blindness. A case of the blind leading the blind. So. The, the Guru Paramartha stories illustrates that very nicely. <laughs> and, and we see that going on in the world today. So Lord Krishna says uh, that for such mudas, naham prakasha sarvasya yoga maya samavata, mudo yam navichamati, loko I never reveal myself to such mudas, no matter how much they may count or whatever, whatever their process of so-called knowledge may be. I reserve the right to remain unknown to them. Yoga Maya Samavata. By my Yoga Maya, my, my energy, I push them away. And that's a very significant point. Uh, when Krishna specifically uses the word Yoga Maya. Because Maha Maya, this is the thing the Sankhya philosophers do not know. They do not understand. But the Maha Maya, uh, which they are analyzing and counting in different ways, the material elements, actually is an emanation from the yoga mind, the Lord's internal spiritual energy. And even if one of these uh, empirical philosophers becomes somehow intelligent enough uh, to ascend to the spiritual platform, the, the, the threshold of spiritual life, as the uh, Mayavadis do, they, they count and they analyze and finally they negate uh, and after negating, they may approach the impersonal Brahma, the Brahma Jyoti. But even then, and this, this, is, the, this is the threshold of, of the Yoga Maya potency, but she pushes them away. Even they're able to, instead of poking their nose in stool, <laughs> poke their nose into the Brahman atmosphere, they get pushed back. Go back. Get out of here. No admittance for you. Because they're not devotees. Rather, they're, again, in another famous verse, their intelligence is impure <coughs> because of a competitive attitude. They, they will never surrender to Krishna. This, this, is not, this is not permitted in their so-called process of knowledge. To surrender to the supreme authority. No, no. We have to understand on our own so, vipariyo smriti. This is actually a competitive mentality. And so for that reason, their intelligence always remains avishuddha. It's always impure. So, Srila Prabhupada said, uh, to enter, to actually enter the spiritual world, is, it is the same sort of problem as entering the sun. Is, if we are in these impure 
earthly, not just earthly, but mixed up, different elements mixed up together. Such body as this, such form as this. How can we enter the sun? We'll just burn up. But one can enter the sun. One has a body of fire. Fire dwells on the sun planet. So if one gets a body of fire, one can enter the sun. So similarly, the spiritual world, by Kunta Dham, that is the pure spiritual abode. So if we get pure spiritual body, if that uh, we're able to accomplish, then we can enter the spiritual world. Otherwise, it's not possible. So it, it seems very difficult uh, <coughs> to develop spiritual body, to become qualified to enter the spiritual world, to know Krishna. It seems very difficult as long as one remains a mudha. See? As long as one, which is all pervading. It's everywhere, within and without. And yet it is imperceptible. Just like today in physics, uh, the physicists, they have certain problems, uh, theoretical problems, mathematical problems in their understanding of the universe, which could be solved if the element ether would be accepted. But because the element ether cannot be perceived, they cannot see it. Therefore, they refuse to accept. And therefore, these problems that they try to solve remain intractable. They can't solve them. So similarly, <coughs> the Lord, He's there. He's all-pervading. He's everywhere. But He cannot be perceived by the rascals, by those whose consciousness is outwardly directed. They cannot see Him. So therefore, it's a big, big problem. Uh, even, even you know, you can uh, you can speak with some people. Prabhupada is actually mentioning this, that there are people who they can understand theoretically in a theoretical way. That yes, it would be better if uh, human society was theistic, if it was, if it was governed, if, it was, if the culture, if everything was based on a theistic understanding, that would be nice. But then they say, but it is so difficult to establish theism. Because, where is this God? We can't see Him. So they think it is, it is very, very difficult. And some of them, although, although they're ready to admit that uh, theism is actually a better system of philosophy, they say it's too hard to establish. Therefore, we have to do the best we can. <laughs> we have to struggle with, with atheistic science, atheistic social principles, because we'll never be able to convince the vast majority of the population that there is, uh, there is a God. It cannot be proved. But no, it can be proved if one is ready to accept the process. Uh, just like in science too, uh, there is the theorem, simple theorem, that uh, water, this alpha, this uh, element or substance we drink every day, on which our life depends. It uh, is composed of two parts, hydrogen and one part, oxygen, H2O, that formula. So now, by my, my present knowledge, my present system of understanding things, I cannot realize that. How am I going to take water apart? and prove that it is two parts oxygen and one part oxygen, uh, two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. It's not possible for me at my present uh, level of, of, uh, of knowledge, and awareness, and understanding. But I could do it if I was prepared <coughs> to surrender to someone uh, who uh, can demonstrate this by experiment who can educate me in the experiment, in the process of knowledge. Then I could do it myself in a laboratory. So similarly, God, Krishna, He can be understood. But we have to accept a teacher. That is pointed out. Guru Krishna Prasade Bhai. By the grace of Guru, one gets Krishna. Also by the grace of Krishna, one gets Guru. One must take the mercy 
aside. One must accept the mercy of Guru and Krishna, and then one can understand. But if one is determined, the Pariyosmriti, determined to hang on to this empirical, non-devotional, competitive, ultimately atheistic attitude, then it won't be possible. Even if one is given every chance. Just like Ravana, the great demon Ravana, he uh, once saw Narada Muni passing through space, and so he called to him, he ordered him, come here. And Narada, because he's a saintly person, thought, I shouldn't give trouble to anyone, also not to him, he's asking me to come, so I'll come. So Narada came down before Ravan, and Ravan ordered him, now, you reveal to me the confidential knowledge of the Vedic syllable Om. I want to know the meaning of the Pranava Omkar. Pardamuni said, I'm sorry, you're not qualified. Ravana <coughs> immediately indignant. What? I am Ravana. <laughs> Sri Lokeshwara Ravana. He gave himself that name. That's the name of Krishna. Sri <laughs> Lokeshwara. He entitled himself to that name. <laughs> I am the lord of this whole Jagat, this whole universe. How can, you, how can you dare say that I am not qualified to understand the meaning of Om? And Narada said, because you're a Vishya, you're a sense enjoyer. And this knowledge, Brahma Gyan, is meant for those whose senses are controlled. So until you are prepared to give up wine, women, and song <laughs> as being the ultimate value of life, You'll never be able to understand this. Even if I, even if I instructed you, you wouldn't be able to, to follow the instruction. So Ravana, he couldn't, he couldn't understand this. You see, he just couldn't understand this. He thought that Narada Muni was insulting him. This is that, you know, there are these persons who say, show me God. If you can't show me God, then he doesn't exist. So his attitude was like that. What if you, if you uh, won't instruct me in this knowledge, then you are, you are somehow being a rascal. You're trying to cheat me in some way. So then he, he threatened Narada. That uh, he called for his sword, Chandra Hasa. This sword uh, moves by remote control. Ravan would just say, kill that person, and the sword would fly through the air and cut off his head and return to Ravan's hand. So he called for Chandrahasa. He said to Narada, you see this weapon of mine, Chandrahasa, this famous sword? Narada said, yes, I see. Ravana said, if you do not instruct me in the meaning of the syllable Om, I will send Chandrahasa to kill you. Narada said, I'm not going to instruct you. Ravan said, then get ready. Narada said, I'm always ready. <laughs> <laughs> so Chandrahasa came and slashed through Narada Muni's form. But nothing happened. <laughs> like cutting through air. Chandrahasa came back completely embarrassed. <laughs> so then Ravana, one by one, he called for all of his astras. He had collected astras from all over the universe. And he fired them at Narada Muni, and they all passed through his form without <laughs> doing any, any harm at all. And they all returned to Ravana, completely defeated. So after Ravana exhausted all of his weapons, then he, he became a little submissive. <laughs> and he said very humbly to Narada, Narada, please. Now, I accept you as my guru. Please tell me, how is it that you are uninjured by the most formidable weapons, weapons which the demigods flee from? How is it you just stand there, smiling, playing on your veena, <laughs> chanting the holy name of the Lord, and these weapons just pass through your body, come out the other side without doing you any damage? And Narada said, I have a spiritual body. <laughs> a Satchit Anandabha, eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss. 
And Robin said, Narda. That's what I want. <laughs> I did so much penance and austerity to get the favor of Brahma, and this is what I asked for, and he said he couldn't give it to me, and you have it, Narada, Narada, now, now I'm your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you. Please reveal to me the secret how I can have such a body which is completely invincible, eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss, this is what I want. And indeed, this is what all the divinities want. Whether they're theist or atheist, but this is actually what everyone wants. So Narada Muni said, just as we hear in this verse in purport, he said, it's no problem, Ram. You actually once had a spiritual body, but you gave it up. You came here to enjoy it. So, Ravana, it's very easy to recover your spiritual body. Yes, please tell me! You simply have to surrender to Lord Vishnu and become his devotee. Ah! <laughs> he blocked his 20 ears. <laughs> <laughs> and then he rebuked Nara. You're a magician. Somehow or other you just tricked me. That's all. There is no Vishnu. I will never surrender to this non-existent Vishnu. Now get out of here! <laughs> so Narada said, Ravana, you are so offensive. Personally, I do not take any offense. But there, some reaction must come to you for this. First you say, you're my disciple, I'm your guru, and now you reject me. So Ravana, one day, Mark my words, one day a monkey will spit in your face. <laughs> then you will know, ten days later, that you will die. And indeed, much later, at Lanka, when Robin, he was sitting before his, his beauty mirror, having his hair done <laughs> by servants, and being decorated and perfumed and dressed very nicely, he was admiring himself. So one day, so on this day, through the window, what appeared to be a very small insect flew in and came right in front of Robin's face and spit in his face. And Robin had caught this thing. What? He grabbed it. Then he looked and he saw it was a little, little monkey. This was Subrima. Uh, Lord Raman, uh, Lakshman and the Vanaras had just crossed the Setu, the bridge from India to Lanka. They were just they just come to the shore of Lanka. And the first thing that happened was Sugriva, he leaped through the air, and as he was flying, he shrank himself down to this very small size. And he came into uh, Ravana's quarters and spit in his face as a greeting. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings from Lord Ram. <laughs> so, so Ravan, he said, Who are you? The little monkey said, I am Sugriva, and those are my greetings. <laughs> Ram and Lakshman and Hanuman and all the Vanaras are now here on Sri Lanka Island, and you and all your hosts of demons will soon die. And then Sugriva left. So Ravan then remembered Narada Muni's blessing in the form of a curse. And he began he became very worried. <laughs> very, very worried. This this Narada Muni said, after a monkey spit in my face I would have only ten days to live. What to do? What to do? Oh I need powerful allies. So it was then that he went down <laughs> Uh, to Patala Loka and visited his great, 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 great grandfather, Bali Maharaj. And to make a long story short, there are many details in this which we don't have time to get into, but he got the darshan of Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj asked him, what do you want? I need your help. Ram, Lakshman and the Vanaras are trespassing on my island. They're threatening me uh, with war. They're threatening to kill me and my whole race. 
and you are our forefather, <coughs> you must come to our aid. Balimara said, yes, no problem. You can be spared all of this trouble if you just give Sita back to him. Never! <laughs> <laughs> Then Bali, after some, he was trying to talk some sense into Robin's head, but it wasn't possible. Robin was so blinded by his arrogance. So Bali Maharaj said, all right, all right. If you don't do this, if you don't give Sita back to Ram, then I, I cannot personally help you. But I'll give you a gift. I'll give you a, a present, which is so valuable, uh, so uh, wonderful that uh, this may, you may be able to uh, increase your, your military force, or somehow spend this to protect yourself from wrong. This, this may be of some assistance to you. So Ravana became very interested. Yes, yes, this sounds good. Something most valuable some item of, of value like I've never seen in this universe. That is very interesting. So Bali brought him to a very great open area, huge, huge open field, Maidan. And in the center of this field, there was a huge golden mountain. At least that's what it looked like. Tremendous golden mountain. According to the scriptural description, it was 72 miles high. And it was covered with solid gold, and it was covered with diamonds as big as Ravana's face. Completely covered with diamonds. So, when Ravana saw this, he, he began to think, wow, he thought. He said, yeah, I'll just take this and uh, yeah, forget about Lanka, forget about... I mean, <laughs> this is all I need, you know? <laughs> I'll just take this and go somewhere and enjoy it. He became so greedy. <laughs> so Bali Maharaj said this is yours you can take it but there's one condition you have to take it yourself cash and carry <laughs> <laughs> giving it to you but you have to take it yourself so Ravan thought no problem for me I lifted the Kailash mountain so I can lift this mountain so he reached beneath it and he was straining and pulling it he managed to just move it slightly and then it crushed his fingers <laughs> he pulled his fingers out screaming in pain <laughs> and he said what is this thing and Bali said you step back step back with me let's let's get uh, some perspective on it so they stepped back a long long distance and then Bali asked what do you see how did how does it look now and he said what actually it looks like a huge earring <laughs> Yes, isn't that what it is? It's a huge earring bedecked with gigantic diamonds. And Balimara said, you have some intelligence, I see. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Do you know whose earring it is? No. No idea. You, you said that I am your great, 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 great grandfather. Yes, I am. But before me, uh, I am the son of Prahlad, and Prahlad is the son of Hiranyakashi. This was the earring of Hiranyakashi. <laughs> when he fought with Nishringadev, that earring fell off his ear and fell down into Patalamoka. So, you were that same Hiranyakashi in your previous birth. And you were killed fighting Lord Nishringadev, who is Vishnu. Now, in that life, Hiranyakashipu, this was your earring. Now, in this life, as Ravana, you can't even lift this earring. <laughs> <laughs> with all of your strength. And the same Vishnu has come in the form of Ram. And you're fighting him. What chance do you think you have? <laughs> you have intelligence. Why don't you use it? <laughs> Ravana blocked his ears again. <laughs> <laughs> and he left. <laughs> and ten days later he was killed. So the 
this is the fate of those who refuse to surrender. So the process is very easy. But as Srila Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is easy for those who are simple. But it is very difficult for those who are hmm, crafty, cheaters, hmm, who are duplicious. So this, <coughs> this is the infection of materialism. Why does one stick to this materialistic process, this empirical process of knowledge? Huh? Why is he Bahir Arta, always looking outward? Why does he uh, place the real value of his life in the material energy? Because, as we were speaking yesterday with Ajahn Prabhu, he was uh, mentioning this, there's a principle of psychology that was uh, uh, introduced by Freud, this uh, mm -hmm. Oedipal complex. In psychoanalysis, one of the, the, the basic principles is that there's this uh, attitude in human beings to uh, overthrow authority, meaning their father, the father figure. So this is called the Oedipal complex because it comes from the name of uh, an ancient figure in Greek drama, Oedipus, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus the king. So Oedipus, he was apparently, he thought himself <coughs> to be the son of uh, some uh, mother and father, but actually uh, he ended up killing his real father. We don't have to get into the whole story. And then, because uh, he became the king in the very kingdom uh, uh, that had been ruled by his father, whom he had killed, then there were inauspicious signs. And one oracle said, uh, things are going wrong here because uh, the killer of the king is now present in this kingdom. And so Oedipus, now that he was king, he took responsibility for it. So then we have to seek out this criminal. We have to find out who killed the king. So he did a whole investigation. And gradually, step by step, it was becoming clear that it was he himself <laughs> who was the killer of the king. Now, he was getting warnings along the way. His wife, the queen, who was actually his mother, because he, was the, he married the widowed queen, who was actually his own mother. So his mother, now his wife, began to get an inkling of what was going on. And she was warning, don't, don't, don't persist in this investigation. Stop it. Leave it. But because he was a man of knowledge, he did persist. And then he found, found out that he himself was the killer. So to punish himself, he blinded himself and left. So it's a great tragedy. So in, in the material world, or in the world of material knowledge, those who are materialists, who stick to material knowledge. You see, knowledge means advantage. That's all knowledge really means. Knowledge means uh, an advantage in exploiting the material energy. This is what knowledge is for. To help us make progress in sense gratification. Knowledge is not to uh, rediscover our constitutional position as servants of Krishna. That is considered tragic. That's, it. <laughs> That's a great tragedy. Uh, a great embarrassment. Because exactly just like Oedipus, he, he discovered that he had killed his father and married his own mother. <laughs> so, also, the living entities, why are we here? Because, not that we have killed Krishna, but this is our attitude. And we want to enjoy our mother. Our mother is Srimati Radharani. Mother Hara. In the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, Hare refers to Radha. And Srila Prabhupada says, Mother Hara. So we are trying to claim Krishna's energy as our own. So, thus we are the greatest rascals. And this is really what knowledge is meant to reveal our rascal them, so that we will give it up. 
and surrender to Krishna again. Krishna is so kind. Even though we're such rascals, how can you be more rascal than that? And kill your own father and take your brother and his wife. But in spite of that, Krishna is still ready to take us back as long as we surrender to him. But if we persist in clinging to our illusory position, false position as being the enjoyers of Krishna's energy, then we will remain in ignorance. It, it is revealed in that story of Oedipus Rex how that was considered a great tragedy uh, to uncover this truth. Oedipus was being warned, don't go any farther. Don't stop this investigation. Uh, so the, the whole current of the material world is like that. When one becomes a devotee, as Prabhupada says, it's like declaring war on Maya. The whole current of the world is flowing against us. No, no, don't, don't inquire into the absolute truth. Don't understand your rightful position as servant of Krishna. Remain in illusion. So this is what makes it difficult. This is what makes progress in Krishna consciousness difficult. But Krishna, Guru and Krishna, uh, they immediately, if we surrender to them, they dispel this illusion. Because that's all it is, it's just Maya. It is just illusion. Like fog, it is compared in Bhagavatam to fog. So when the sun, fog is very dense, very difficult to perceive when one is surrounded by fog. But when the sun, Krishna Surya Sama, Krishna is like the sun, when the sun rises, then the fog is evaporated. Are there any questions? Yes? It's sometimes said that Ravana's Lanka is, is Salem, Sri Lanka. But I also read that Robert says in the Bhagavatam that it's the same. No, Srila Prabhupada doesn't say that Lanka is Brazil, but he says that Lanka stored his gold there in Brazil. Brazil is actually uh, the region that was under the control of Ravana's brother. His name was Mahi Ravana. He had a kingdom under the sea in a network of lotus, gigantic lotus stems. <coughs> uh, these stems uh, grew up from undersea tunnels, which also went under the continent of South America. So Ravana and his, Mahi Ravana, demoniac hordes that lived in these undersea tunnels. And there uh, Ravana stole, uh, sorry, he, he stored his, the gold that he stole <laughs> from others. So that is why still today they find them huge, they found huge tunnels under, network of tunnels underneath Brazil and other South American countries. And they found huge golden helmets and breastplates and swords, many times bigger than could be wielded by man. This has been independently confirmed, I've seen this reported in certain books. So, any other questions? Yes? How is for Ramana and your side do you know possible to see the spirits with the body of yeah, well, Krishna, just as Krishna, he reveals himself. Prakat, Aprakat. The, the spiritual realm, spiritual form of the Lord and the Lord's devotees are invisible to our material eyes, but they can reveal themselves by their mercy. So, just as when Krishna appeared 5,000 years ago, great demons like Kamsa could see him only by the Lord's mercy. So Ravana also <coughs> could see Narada by Narada Muni's mercy. Any other questions? Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Bhagavatam ki jai, Lord Vaynana ki jai.